Hey. Hey, Guy. How are you? Yeah, good. Uh, nice to be able to join this meeting. Did you know about it before you're invited? I think I didn't even know this one was happening, actually. This is the first I heard about it. So I, uh, I was curious <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think your project will probably intersect with this uh, work stream a lot more than probably a lot of our other Bytecode Alliance uh, work streams. Hey, David. You were missing. I didn't say hi to everybody. Uh, so how are you all doing today? Doing pretty good. I want to pub a thing, if you don't mind. Uh, Eric uh, Eric wrote a, did a write-up for our February stream where um, got, we had a few different cool things that happened, but the main thing I want to shout is that the Bytecode Alliance now has an events calendar. Um, getting fancy over here. <laughs> I know CNCF has had it forever, but I'm muddling my way through on a low budget. <laughs> um, and, uh, so that part, that part's exciting for me. Um, and I figure folks, it'll be relevant to folks here. I should shout out. That's not actually in the post. Uh, David <laughs> wanted to hold it back until uh, there were a couple more items on there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Soon. I'll see. Soon. Soon. know it's um, so folks can find it in the future all right so how about we give it to about 1103 yeah or 1105 or five after the hour because not everybody is on the same hour <laughs> The man, the myth, the legend, Taylor. Yeah, you say that now. <laughs> it's a beautiful snow outside where I'm at right now, so. Really? Yeah. Oh, boy. I mean, here's the thing. A lot of people in a lot of places complain about, oh, the weather's so crazy here. And I'm like look no like out here in the mountain west of the u.s we get like i have clear memories of like starting a day at like 65 oh hi kitty um 65 7 65 to 68 degrees we're talking like 18 celsius right and then like dropping to snowstorm and 32 degrees or zero degrees in two hours so it's like that's normal for the spring here our last snow sometimes comes in Ju june and then a few weeks after that, we're at 90 degrees. So, I mean, who knows? Variety is the spice of life. Yes, you it got is. It, you got it all over there. Awesome. Uh, so, anybody, would anybody like to, uh, you know, uh, chair the meeting? I'm fine doing it again, unless you want to do it, David. I welcome you doing it, Taylor. If you'd like to, um, any, we've done it several times. If anybody else would like to, um, like, to you know, let everybody have an opportunity, except for guy, guy is probably going to be busy. I'm hoping to keep you all busy. Uh, so, um, <laughs> be careful about who chairs. <laughs> all right. Uh, Taylor, head out. Okay. Awesome. Well. Welcome everyone to the WASM working group of TAG Runtime. Um, this is uh, the Tuesday, March 5th meeting. Um, it is a CNCF meeting, so please 
uh, remember that this is governed by the CNCF Code of Conduct, um, which can generally be summarized as just be nice to people. So please do that. Um, keep your comments nice. And um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started today. We have just one bigger item on the agenda. Um, and this is why we record these, because this is a good one to come back and watch. Um, we went ahead and invited uh, Guy Bedford to come in, and I'll let Guy introduce himself and everything, but just having worked tangentially, not tangentially, like alongside in the WebAssembly space with, with Guy Farouk. Guy is a genuine human being, awesome person who has done a lot of great work around something called Wazi Bert, which is something we've mentioned several times here in this in this meeting. And we decided it'd probably be good just to hear it from someone who's actually been working on it and see where things are going, kind of how things work and, and that stuff. So um, that was the really the main item on the agenda. At the If we have some time at the end, we'll save some time like we normally do for any WASM news that people have. But the main thing is um, going to be just hearing about Wazi Bert today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it right off to Guy. Okay, thanks, Taylor. Um, I'm hoping as much as possible we can... Uh, I don't know how, how, how much folks are familiar with Wazi Bird or have tried it or have looked into the project. Um, but, you know, an, an overall sort of kind of like discussion about the project. And I think what's also really interesting to me is that you are, it sounds like you're interested in a lot of bird use cases there. Uh, and so I'm really interested to hear a lot more about that. And also how we can steward the Wazi Bird project into these virtualization use cases. So uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the overall project design space is that for preview two, we define everything for, with, by our world and virtualization is a first class construct. So if you implement a world, um, if you think of at the moment, Wazi Bird only supports uh, import virtualization. It does not support export virtualization. Uh, and the only case that applies to is incoming server handlers. So we do not yet support that feature of virtualizing the incoming server. That's an important key feature that should be supported in the project. But for now, it's just import virtualization. So import virtualization would still apply to outgoing handlers where you create an outgoing HTTP request because you're doing that through an import in the WASI subsystem uh http subsystem so if you think of all of those imports you're importing all these different subsystems uh with wazi vert you implement all of the imports as exports and uh inside wazi vert it then imports all of the imports and then so it's got the same shape in, of interfaces that are exported and the same shape of interfaces um that are imported i can actually just share my screen and show you that in the project uh, so that would be in the, the width for Wazi Vert. It defines uh, just very lazily uh, it, it, everything that it imports, it also exports. Uh, and by doing that, uh, in the middle, you can implement virtualization. And so that's like the really hard part is like comprehensively implementing this. And uh, so the original design was that we should be able to do this by subsystem. So if I just want a virtualized environment, I should just have a virtualization that just imports environment, exports environment, and just virtualizes that. And so that's why we have all of these independent virtualizations that also apply. Uh, that was the original design goal of the project. Unfortunately, we hit some snags when, when implementing that where uh, because we don't yet have first-class streams, uh, if you have any interface that implements a stream, you have to virtualize every other interface that virtualizes streams. And so we hit this kind of cliff where like it worked great for environment for the initial prototype of the project. And then when we move to the other interfaces, um, like uh, I guess file system, uh, we had to then start pulling in a lot of other stuff. And so we designed a way to do that that was not going to pull in the world. So uh, th there's this kind of idea that there's a minimal thing without the streams. And so uh, if you pull in FS, it'll pull in all the other interfaces that use streams, but not every single interface. So there, there's kind of a design area there that we need to think about a little bit for the project where like it tried to be hypermodular to start. That was the design goal. And then it kind of just ended up 
virtualizing everything anyway. And to give you an idea of the difference in virtualization sizes, um, if you look at the Wazivert project, uh, let me just go into the repo here. Uh, we've got this virtual, uh, sorry, in the test folder, we build various uh, generated virtualizations. And hey guys, do you mind bumping up the text size? Okay. Uh, and to give you an idea of the size of the virtualizations, these uh, the composed WASM uh, files here are the app that I'm testing composed with the virtualization all in one component file. And the version here without the doc composed is just the just the vert adapter. So to give you an idea of the vert adapter size, when we just got it down to those environment variables, we were able to build like 20 kilobyte uh, virtualizations, which was nice because it, it seemed like something that we didn't want to bloat too much. And then as soon as you go to FS, it goes up to like 80K. And so I was trying to avoid that cost because I was thinking about the browser use case, but it was possibly over-optimized and maybe it's not that bad to just build in everything. And, and the project should probably move in a direction where we just always build in everything and forget about these modular virtualizations. So that was like the way we started. And I'm explaining that to kind of explain how the project structured, because that was one of the original design goals was modular virtualization. I think it might make sense for the project to maybe table that and just accept that we should just have, um, you know, potentially all virtualizations just being 100, 150K. And then it just have all virtualizations do everything and that'll simplify the project a whole bunch. Um, and also I'm going through to kind of describe to-dos on the project as well, to give some idea of what type of um, uh, work on the project is needed to achieve certain goals. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing to think about with YC Bird, that we should focus on the sort of use cases. I'd be really interested to hear what use cases you are looking to apply them to so that we make sure that the, the project is making those use cases work really easily because writing it to just do every type of virtualization is much harder than specializing it initially to the virtualizations that are most useful to, to people. Uh, yeah, so that's that that kind of, if, if, if that made sense, then the rest of the code base will kind of make sense from it because I think those are some of the, like the, the design structures. Uh, the, we've got this virtual adapter that is built that represents the um, the, the virtual uh, component. And it, it was originally separated by environment, then it became IO, and effectively now we just have one big component. Uh, we build that adapter from the uh, build adapter.sh. So we run this script first and build that adapter, have a lot of optimizations on it. And that's what gives us basically internally uh, these vert adapters. And uh, you can, uh, uh, if, if I can actually like look at these, uh, if we look at like encapsulate.wasm, uh, you can see it's implementing a lot of WASI interfaces, all of the ones that implement streams. Uh, whereas if I look at something that is um, more like in none, which should implement nothing. Uh, let's see if I can get this here. Sorry, I've got the um, right. And none that was in, you can see it implements a much smaller world. Um, so it's depending on your virtualization options, you basically turn off imports in the WASI vert adapter and only implement those things as exports. And then you've got an encapsulating virtualization because when you compose that with the application you're running, the WASI vert exports become the application's imports and the WASI vert imports become the application's imports. And so if there's no imports in the vert adapter, you're not gonna have any imports in your application. You've got a fully encapsulated system. So uh, the, the sort of guts of the project as I mentioned, is this virtual adapter and particularly the IO adapter side where we implement all of the WASI interfaces and implement everything as an export. So this is IP name lookup, resolve addresses, 
implemented as an exported interface in terms of calling the imported interface. And everything's got uh, logging. So the, the sort of base level of WASI version of debug mode can also act as a, a logging tracer. So if you just attach a debug vert that doesn't do any encapsulation, you can just get trace logging throughout your whole application because all the syscalls will be logged. Um, yeah, uh, so that's that's the overview of it. I think just fleshing out these virtualization interfaces was a large part of the design space. Um, I see there's something in the chat. Oh, uh, sure. So uh, I, I would like to, as much as possible, kind of make this a more interactive discussion and, and hope that that kind of gives an overview of where the project is today, what goals it was designed in mind with. Um, I can go a little bit uh, more through the kind of test structure and the code structure uh, and, and the example applications. But yeah, it would help to hear what what, what people are interested to, to know about the project. Uh, I didn't see who got their hands up first. Was it David or Taylor? It was David. OK, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Guy, thank you for the introduction to uh, uh, Wesley Burt. Um, so I'm guessing that folks that are going to view this video may not necessarily have a lot of background in virtualization or you know, the concepts that are at play uh, in, this, in this repository. Um, so can you, can you talk about some use cases for virtualization? Like what when would somebody want to use this and for, for what reasons? Like what problems does it solve? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I, I assumed the context because I, I assumed we're in a, a component space uh, and folks are familiar with components, but if that's not the case, certainly. Um, uh, right, so if you've got a, a, a component-based application, uh, you've got a, a well-defined interface for all of your system calls and all your system calls are being done in, in uh, well-typed, you know, component model APIs. Uh, with the virtualization model, uh, you can uh, deterministically uh, handle the composition in the component model for uh, plugging in virtualizations to component-based applications. So. Uh, if I to like, I guess the easiest example is the, the file system virtualization example. So if you have an application that is using WASI file system imports, these are your standard uh, file system uh, descriptor interfaces and streaming interfaces and things like that. Uh, you can, instead of plugging it into the, the systems uh, operating system file system, you can create a virtualization component that imports and exports the file system. Uh, and when it exports the file system, it implements all that descriptor, um, all those descriptor mechanisms, streaming mechanisms, et cetera, uh, in, in terms of uh, another Rust application that's going to handle them. And then instead of pointing it to the native file system and, and calling the imported calls, it can actually direct them to uh, any other interfaces that you want. So uh, the, the base WASI word today will, will provide, for example, if you have an application that's going to read files, uh, it'll uh, be able to virtualize that so that those files are already available, even though it looks like a normal file read. It's actually just coming from the in-memory uh, file system instead of from the operating system. And then you can do a lot of, a lot of other similar things like that. And that's one of the main uses we have for WASI vert in particular is uh, if you building a component that that's built in on a, for a Rust application that's going to use a lot of like operating system APIs. And then you want to do something like run that component in a browser. You can use YC vert to say, okay, you're only going to access uh, these files and these are the environment variables you want. You can provide that virtualization to it and then you can run, you can uh, do a, a composition and that, that composition is a single component that you can then run uh, in a browser uh, without it actually being available in the host. Uh, so hope that gives a little bit more background for, for folks who uh, are, are curious about how these things can be used. I think what I'm most interested in right now as well is, is as a project, uh, we need to kind of steward this project in the ecosystem Firstly, focusing its 
uh, use cases and, and finding out who the users are so that we can have those users support the project and, ma and, and maintain issues on the project. Um, and then uh, kind of just plug it in from a, from a product perspective, because right now uh, it's something that, uh, yeah, I, so I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that, that you folks could be a, our, our users for this and um, yeah, the, to, to hear about how you want to use it and um, how we can get you using it. I think that's what uh, would be really great to, to discuss a little bit more. So you you brought up the file system virtualization, and to me, like I I run a lot of uh, you know, uh, web apps or you know service apps uh, respond to HTTP traffic, right? Um, so for for me, one of the things that I really like is uh, virtualizing file system for static assets, right? So um, I'm able to you know put a bunch of static assets into something and I don't have to have it on a file system. I can virtualize that and you know load those static assets just like it was coming from a file system, but uh, you know joined together in a component, which to me that that's pretty useful. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Th thank you for diving into that. I really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, yeah. Off the um, box. yeah. Um, my apologies if I got the framing wrong. I assumed this was a, a technical kind of contributor based overview, but like if I've got the the audience wrong, uh, we can certainly fo focus more on use cases as well. No, it's great. Uh, it's it's it both really. Uh, so. Uh, the, the WASM Working Group in Tag Runtime uh, is part about educating folks who are probably used to the Kubernetes ecosystem and are probably building apps in the Kubernetes ecosystem as it is today. And you know, starting to show folks what are the things uh, that's out there in WebAssembly and how can they be, uh, you know, how can they blend into your your workflows that you're you're building today, and how can we help people be more productive in in those? So understanding right. the, the, the underlying that's really good for you. Yeah. So, and like, yeah. Uh, so you can create Rust components today um, with a, a WASM thirty two WASI target on a Rust application, and it'll spit out a component that imports WASI preview one uh, interfaces. Uh, using um, the component model, you can turn that very easily into a preview two component. And once you've got these preview two components, you can do all of these nice virtualization things. And so, yeah, certainly that's uh, that's kind of like the, the the power of the component model. That one, once you've got that binary, it's very easy to do these virtualizations that traditionally are very difficult things. You you think of these tools as a whole bunch of set of tools like you know I, I just mentioned like the debug tracing is something that just happens to like fall out of this normally you need an entire tool chain for that kind of thing so the because we have these strong abstractions that are based on the modularity of the interfaces and based on composability and portability uh you can you can have these very strong virtualizations so you can take any existing native application you can uh you, using the current preview 2 apis is if it's using those existing apis you can turn it into a preview 2 binary and then you can do all these kind of virtualizations that are maybe familiar where you want to do things like set environment variables, set um, static file system, uh, things like that. But I think the important thing to, to preface a lot of it with as well is that like uh, the component model is, is, is now uh, you know, at, at version 0.2.0 and is, you can create these binaries and, and they're like it's a stable format to target. WASI vert is still very much an in-development project and it's still kind of needs to find its uh need to find uh it, its its real um, position in terms of like are we focusing entirely on file system virtualization or are we going to do um you know dynamic file system virtualization where if you if you load a file system stream you can dynamically configure that you actually want to get that over http from s3 so we can route like the file system to the http system and there there's a lot of really interesting stuff i think the core of how to do it is to just implement the imports and exports, and then you can write any custom Rust code in the middle. So you, you can do all of these things and everything is possible. But what I'm really hoping we can we can discuss and, and put some more thought to is like, 
how we're going to like focus on what possibilities are most important to people because uh, I, I guess it's one of the problems I've had with the project is that uh, like to give one example of usability like when we first discussed this project and I was discussing it with Bailey uh, we said you know we want this to be a, a encapsulating virtualization because you don't want people to write applications that are going to import um, operating system functionality you don't want them to access so it's a security mechanism uh, and so by default it should be denying all virtualizations and it should deny all imports and that's how the project behaves today because we felt this is a great security model but it turns out that's terrible for usability because when you use the project when you use YZvert today uh, if you use it with no options you'll get a binary that as soon as it does any syscall it'll uh, it'll trap because it's being fully encapsulated and so the, the full deny functionality, like that as the whole security use case, yeah, we solved the security use case, but we failed on the usability use case. So in terms of like it getting people excited about the project and telling them to use it, um, it does fall over because of the security thing right now. And I think one of the things we need to maybe do there, and I'm hoping you you all can also share your thoughts on, on what, what, what you'd like to see there is maybe make the security um, off by default so that like, we make it easier to do virtualizations that work and then have very careful, like, you know, we can do a lot maybe in the logging. So like maybe you get a, um, a, a ver you get have like two modes, you virtualize in a debug mode and all the syscalls are supported, but you get like some logging, like it called this syscall or warning this syscall was called. And then you run it in like a release mode after that. And then it says, uh, now we're actually, and now it's going to do all the strong virtualization and yeah, it's going to trap and it's going to give you all these things. But like in terms of like getting people excited and say, hey, use this today, like it's not where it needs to be to do that. And that's why we need people who are interested in contributing to the project, taking those use cases, driving those use cases, supporting those, you know, are we supporting encapsulation and security or supporting uh, making it really easy to virtualize file systems or environment variables and have those things just work out. So there, there's a lot of interesting design discussion I'm hoping we can continue to have there. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. I have a bunch of, I had one question and now I have like four questions. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, yeah. So you no, know, you're, you are totally speaking to the right audience here just to reiterate that. Like, this is great for, for what, like people want to hear about all of it. Um, and so, um, the first question I have is, um, I, th it's actually more of just a request. Can you show a demo of this in action and what like the final wit looks like when you've encapsulated everything. I, so uh, this is coming from experience. So for a while, before we figured out another way to do it, we were experimenting with something called a WASI fill inside of the WASM cloud space, where we basically were virtualizing a lot of this stuff. And it took me generally at least three or four times to explain like, no, this is, this is what's going on. So I think it'd be really helpful to maybe see like the wit before the wit after and like what that actually means. Um, like when you, when you, dump out the world from from the component um i think that would be really useful and then um i also would love in context of that like what makes wasi vert different than doing this myself so like if i want to virtualize away like the file system like w why would we want a project and this is this is a this is set up specifically to be a softball <laughs> um is like why why would I use Wasi Vert over just going in and defining a world that imports um, and exports like environment or whatever, and then I do my own thing with it and I wrap it? Um, what's the what's the kind of motivation behind that? So those two quite I think that first request will probably lead pretty easily into the second one, but I, that was what I wanted to start with. I have more questions, but I'll put them at the end of after this and James goes. Yeah, I, I didn't actually prepare a demo for this, um, but uh, I can. Uh, we can try and see how it goes. Um, let's see. But yeah, you, you're putting me on the spot here, Taylor. <laughs> Hopefully in a good way. Well, you never know. Uh, okay, so um, if we so the if we just look at the help for Wazi Bird. We've got a um, uh, the main options are uh, allow based options because the default behavior of the CLI is to deny everything. Uh, so the the project has two ways it can be used. There's the CLI 
And then there's the the main kind of um, uh, you can actually use it uh, programmatically as well. And so by default, if I do a, a wasi vert, uh, and then I do out vert dot wasm, it'll just give me like a default uh, virtualization that virtualizes across all the interfaces that are implementing streams, basically. Uh, and then if I do a, a, a wasi vert and say like, uh, so you can see it's just exporting everything, it's not importing everything. And so if I say like allow standard IO and I create a new vert uh, I'm now importing all of the standard IO interfaces um, and I'm still exporting everything. So if I want to compose it with a component, what I can do is, uh, let's see if I've got a component here. Um, uh, so this, this example won't work at 10, but just to give an example. So like here's the CLI component that imports uh, from the uh, various CLI interfaces and exports a CLI run function. So it's a command. Um, and if I do YZ vert and operate on this binary, let me increase my font size actually, sorry about that. Um, and I can then say, uh, if I don't do anything, I just output it as a vert uh, I'll get uh, so now instead, because I passed in a WASM binary, instead of getting back a, a virtual component that just imports and exports, I'm now getting back a composed component that exports the thing that the original component exported. But the imports are inside of it have been replaced with the vert imports and, uh, sorry, exports. And because the vert by default encapsulates and it doesn't have any imports itself, there is no imports remaining in this virtualized component. So as I say, if I run that, it won't work because the virtualization isn't implementing everything. Um, but if instead, what I can do is I can say YZ vert allow uh, standard IO, uh, and then I can output. And now it should just have the ability to import standard IO interfaces. And so you can kind of uh, deterministically vet this, these imports and you can say, okay, I can see it only has uh, the ability to work to standard IO. So this it matches my you know, target um, deployment policy for this application. Uh, and uh, the, for example, if I wanted to virtualize an, an environment variable, I could say like, uh, let's see what it is for environment variables. Uh, I think it's, Right, so you can just provide environment variables directly with the end flag. So I can say in var equals value, and then I can uh, compose that with, with the binary and output a, a, a virtualized binary, and that'll deny everything, but support the environment variables being imp implemented from that interface of the environment variables in the um, uh, that, that we provided. Um, so yeah, that, that's the gist of it. And then with FS virtualization, you can mount various uh, file system folders inside of that virtualization as well. Uh, so hopefully that gives some clarity to the overall workflows. I see we've got a um, couple of messages. Okay, great. And your second question, uh, remind me again, what, what, was this, what was the second question? I think you mostly answered it with that command line tool popping up right there, but it was basically like, why would I just not like roll my own like world and import and export and then do my own virtualization there, which you can do by the way, I'm not saying you can't, but like, why would I use WASI vert over yeah. something like that? I think um, you answered it <laughs> with the tool. Yeah, and, and WASI vert as well, as I say, like the, the core of the project is that virtual adapter, which is like a single Rust binary that is being built and it's just being composed in using the component model semantics. So you're always running against that binary and that binary has been built to support all of the WASI interfaces. As I say, it's not perfect. It's the, there's still some to do's there and I'm hoping that people are interested in can can try use it and 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 think about what use cases they want to contribute to that it's also in theory an easy project to use as a base if if people are interested in hacking on this stuff because 
you have the like you can clone the project, you have the ability to create a virtual adapter, and then you can implement any logic you want in that virtual adapter. So I can hook into all of my system APIs and I can just write whatever Rust code I want for those system APIs and call the operating system versions of the APIs if if you want to. And so it's it's sort of the template for how to do a virtualization. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, e e like ideally folks can use Wazivert, but if I was, if I had a really specific use case and I really didn't want to contribute it back to Wazivert, it's a great project to fork and just write whatever virtualizations you want because it's all the hard problems are solved. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and yes, exactly. So the, the virtual adapters are themselves uh, WASM, which executes against the uh, the main application WASM, and they live in separate memories. So you you, you have complete isolation uh, between the virtualization layer and the main application layer. So you're not uh, you're not making your application behave any differently. You're just plugging in the virtualization. James. Cool. So, um, so I think one of the, this project keeps on coming up in conversations that we're having is around um, how we're going to potentially publish the WASM binaries to like an OCI artifact, uh, like as an OCI artifact in a OCI registry. And, um, and specifically like, um, you know, how do we package up files like static assets and environment variables and those types of things. Um, and I think you mentioned kind of the dynamic virtualization. And I think that would maybe come into play here too in the like Kubernetes ecosystem is I packaged this up for a um, a local pack, like a local image in a, and I got a file that I'm using for testing those types of things. But then I want to be able to swap in S3 or a Kubernetes storage backend or some other type of file system. and so. I think those are some of the ideas that we're, we're discussing these things. And I, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about like where you're thinking with the dynamic virtualization side of things. Yeah, when we first created the project, the hope was that any virtualization that makes sense to configure is something that we could support in a way that like would fit this module or adapt to module. Uh, so obviously we don't want to ship a whole bunch of custom S3 virtualization code to everyone's adapter. So a lot of it is like how you create a generic adapter that can also plug into custom things. Um, but yeah, the, the, the first step there is to support dynamic file systems. So right now we only have a static file system that you can read from uh, when you virtualize the file system. If you're not virtualizing the file system, it's just a pass through file system. Uh, supporting in-memory dynamic file system is would be fantastic to see in the project. Uh, and then supporting the ability to uh, link those streams to uh, other types of streams. So uh, ideally, we could figure some abstraction out at the streaming level where you, you can kind of route it to any kind of stream and say, hey, I've got a HTTP stream I want to use as a file system stream or, or something like that. and and be really cool if we could lean into streams on that and, and use that as the abstraction model and, and come up with a good way to do that. Uh, as I say, this this work needs to be use case driven. So uh, I, I work at Fastly and like Fastly isn't doesn't have use cases for Wazi Vert right now. Uh, whereas there's uh, other companies that have really interesting use cases around virtualization. And so I think a lot of this is it's just plugging it into the right people. Uh, and and uh, as I say, everything here is possible. Like the abstractions are incredibly powerful. Uh, you, you can virtualize on a stream and uh, be able to reroute these things. And if, if someone wanted to um, implement like an S3 based virtualization for a file system, uh, and have like different types of layers between a dynamic, you could have a dynamic file system at the base, and then you could mount like a S3 folder in there as well, and then have other types of, like all of that would be absolutely fantastic to see. Um, but it, it's got to be driven by the by the use case. I think that's the 
the biggest thing I can uh, hope that you can take away from. Uh, yeah. So, they... yeah, as a follow up to that, I have another question and kind of some use cases to to see what people think. But like the as a follow up to that side of the thing. So can I take a um, component? You said there's an API I can use. So can I do this on the fly? Like if I were a runtime or sorry, not a runtime, like an application platform of some kind, could I take an, a given set of things to me and say like, I'm going to virtualize this for you and then run it um, like via an API as well, like an like a like an actual library you could import. Is that doable? Uh, you mean to do the virtualization through an API? Um, I mean like actually the OCI example is the perfect one. I have an OCI artifact, right? And now I'm going to adapt it to run in Kubernetes or I'm going to adapt it to run somewhere else. And so something like run WASI or any other thing that's going to want to virtualize it can come down and say, okay, I've taken this artifact that could technically run anywhere else, but now I'm going to add the virtualization I need to be able to run inside of Kubernetes, like on the fly using like a, an API instead of a CLI, like an actual like so, like software library. Um, is that doable right now with with what's in WASI? Because I think I heard you mention that, but I just want to double check that before I kind of go on to the other use cases I was I was thinking of that might be helpful for you. Yeah, if, if I'm hearing you right, um, yeah, so Wazzy Bird has a, a Rust-based API that you can use to create virtualization. So if you have an application where you're consuming arbitrary uh, arbitrary components that are going to have importing arbitrary interfaces, and you want to uh, dynamically you know, process those applications, turn them into applications that don't only depend on the things that you allow or have the, the right permissions and, and the right, right run or set up to run on the right system, yeah, what Wazibert can be run, uh, can be embedded anywhere. I, I'm pretty sure Wazibert should build as a component itself, so you could run it as a component. Even um, it, I, I don't think there's any reason that it couldn't be deployed in a component environment. Uh, I did want to also, uh, so the the main component project I maintain is the the Jaker project for JavaScript components, and I very much do want to embed. Wazzy Vert in Jco and the way Jco does everything is it self hosts everything as components. So uh, Jco's bind gen is written in in Rust for creating uh, JS bind gen and it self hosts that through a component to support it in JavaScript. Uh, I, I'd hope to do the same thing for Wazzy Vert so that you could in JavaScript process these applications uh, in, in the JS tool chain and that should work in browser or or uh, Node.js. Um, and then yeah, you can you can kind of to take an arbitrary application, virtualize it, run it in the browser, and you can do the whole thing end to end without uh, needing any any other tools. Um, so uh, that's very much uh, an, an ideal goal for for Jaco as well. Uh, and, and did you say that that led on to another point? All uh, there's two people in queue. I'll come back with any use cases they may or may not hit. Um, I have a I have a bunch, and I just wanted to start running them by not just you, but kind of everyone here to see like, oh yeah, I like that too. You know, and that way you can we. I think it'd be good to have those use cases around in a recorded format. So we can go, hey, like people, when we last talked, said we probably would need this. And then we can start like helping contribute what we need as we as we implement them. So anyway, sorry, Bailey, go ahead. Yeah, I, I realized uh, one of the answers to one of your previous questions, Taylor, uh, that might make it easier to contextualize for other people is that why is it worth uh, us all collaborating and jamming around Wazzy Vert? Uh, to me, it's that Wazzy Vert in a lot of ways is like my config for Wazzy because it, it lists all the different ways that I can interact with Wazzy uh, effectively. And that's where uh, we're seeing some interesting traction happen inside the Bytecode Alliance with uh, another tool called WAC for component composition. And the idea of integrating Wazzy Vert into WAC is really exciting because WAC tries to figure out how to instantiate a component with all the right stuff to pass in. Well, when you're doing that, you're kind of passing in your config for your WASI. Uh, so in a lot of ways, uh, there, there are some uh, overlap and similarities. Um, and yeah, I loved your last use case because it's like, hey, I'm a platform and it's really scary to give people socket access. And I really want people to virtualize a file system. Um, and and so anyways, uh, I just wanted to kind of add that part there for you. Um, that's the very simple use case. I'll start at the high level and pass on to the next person in the queue.
Hey guy, um, I also have a question about a specific use case. Um, as you may know, I am very interested in implementing the wide key value world. Um, and one idea that I have is when implementing like a specific provider for wide key value, say like a Redis, using Redis Rust SDK, um, behind the SDK, it's using file system or uh, sockets. And when I build a uh, implementation of YZQ by using Redis, can I compile that into a component and compose with YZVirg to virtualize the uh, sockets connection that Redis requires? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. That's a really exciting use case as well. It's it's great to see the um, the progress on these uh, these specifications. The as I said at the beginning, one of the things with Wazi Bird is because we don't have an a, 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 like a first class streaming interface until we have Preview three. Uh, as soon as you have an interface that implements stream, so if you have an interface that does not do streams or polls. You can have them as separate virtualizations and they can compose in in parallel. But as soon as you have something that touches streams or poles, uh, you need your streams and poles because the the IDs always need to be owned by a single manager of the of the IDs and so um, for the resource IDs in in the model. So uh, if 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 they you you basically then have to always have it running in a in a single virtualization. So the 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 way that Wazi Verb works is is it does lead us to having a single um, project that does all of the virtualizations. Um, and so, what I would say to that is, like, if you want to see new Wazi interfaces implemented in Wazi Verb, as long as it's part of the Wazi standardization process, we should we should always accept those into the Wazi Verb project. And so uh, I, I think that's a standard way we can achieve that kind of thing. So just it's extending the width and extending the, the, the virtual adapter to support the new interfaces, and then it'll work alongside everything else. So I think that model for Wazi Vert is how we want to keep developing the project uh, for the most part, um, at least until we, we, we have the ability to do the separations, um, yeah. Uh, so and and then it would be the same sort of abstractions on on the streams that we're figuring out for the things like the file system, et cetera. So maybe it's the other um, interfaces that are going to drive the next level of development in WASI Vert, where as we bring these new WASI system subsystems in, uh, we we can then mature the project around those shared abstractions. So um, I, I would be really excited to see. Uh, more WASI APIs implemented in WASI Bird, we should have, uh, yeah, uh, I think it really does come together as a project that, that can support all WASI virtualizations. Thanks. And and also, even if you don't want to work on an ex a perfect PR, you can always fork a project, add in your own stuff, and uh, it'll get you uh, further than uh, doing it on your own because it already does all the other streaming interfaces that you'd otherwise need to do a virtualization. So um, now I'll list some, I was, I've had these in mind for a while, possible use cases, and I'm curious what people think. So I'm just going to start listing them and then we can talk through like what you think if you're like, nah, those, those were not good ideas for Vazi or you're like, yeah, those are great. Good idea. We'll do that later, whatever it might be. But um, one of the first ones I think we'll run into is like the reason that I try, tried to drive some work around having runtime config is that there's some applications that won't have environment variables um, available to them. And there's going to be some applications that might be more like WASI CLI based with the environment. They want environment variables, but they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily importing config. So I was like, one of those things I wanted to be able to do is like basically adapt those back and forth. So if I have environment variables, they all get now set as like config keys that are the same as the environment variable and the value and then vice versa. Like if it's a config value, then there's an environment variable called that with a 
maybe like a configurable prefix or something you can add to it and then like it does it. So that's that's one um, that I think would be like something we could do probably right off the bat because I don't think it's terribly difficult and then include that in there. Um, another one that is big that I've heard kind of like chatting about and brainstorming is what I'm just calling interceptors. It's not a real term. I just in invented it. But like the idea of I want to be able to forward, it could be to a policy service or some sort of compliance framework or whatever of I want to intercept HTTP file systems, whatever it might be, and send those off to a policy engine and then be able to get it back and say like, so that way, anytime I'm doing those, I'm basically putting them out. So I can glue it in. And what may, what I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's a, a use case here that could be, um, that could be worked on, um, especially if we could come up with like a generic way to hook into those types of systems. So it doesn't matter if you're using OPA or, or something else on, on the outside. And you can essentially have like a whole framework around like, hey, here, I'm going to lock it down no matter what the language is. Like you just brought me some code you wrote in, you know, like some obtuse language that's new, but it compiles to WebAssembly. Great. I can still like intercept. Yeah. Uh, Bailey called it like middleware kind of stuff. And I'm wondering if that falls in that use case of WasiVert as well. So those are kind of the top two that I've, I've when I've been brainstorming, I've heard people go like, ooh, that sounds nice. So I'm just curious what you think of at least those two. And I think there's others I could think of, but those are the big ones. I really like that you're being able to explore the different like um, chaining things with like we could say, well, I get my environment variables from this other type of system and and things like that. Like, and because it will, it should you know scale to implementing a lot of WASI subsystems. So you can map one WASI subsystem to another. And so if you want to you know go from environment variables to config, you can you can kind of integrate that kind of thing. So like that's that's really interesting. Um, in in terms of how the adapter works, uh. Right now, it is a a single piece of static code, but when you use WasiVert, it, it's already built the adapter. And so WasiVert is actually um, just a composer of this existing adapter. And one of the things it does to the adapter is it just chooses which interfaces you're going to use, and it does memory injections to kind of set configuration options. So it, it's got this existing build of the adapter. And then it injects some memory in that is like, tells it, you know, here's a file system, the static file system, here's the environment variables we want to use. These are the virtualization options. And then when that adapter runs, it picks up all of that injected memory and knows how to run. And the other thing, the virtualization, the, the, virtu the composition, so it's like two programs, it's the composition program, and then it's the actual virtual program that, that's embedded. Uh, so it's a programming embedding another program. And uh, the uh, the other thing that the in, in the composing embedding program does is it'll mutate the imports and exports and remove the exports that are not allowed that sorry, remove the imports that are not allowed and remove the exports that aren't being virtualized. And so there is a lot of scope in that mutation space to to be able to uh, decide how you want to do a little bit of rewiring. Um, and and so. Uh, that that's how the configuration model gets mapped. So if, if you want to be able to embed a policy or those kind of things, you can do a lot in the mutation space as opposed to in the actual static virtual binary where there's a cost. Anything that goes in the virtual binary is going to increase the size of the virtual binary size for everyone. But what goes in the mutating um, part of the of the virtualizer that the, the mutates and composes, uh, you can put a lot more in there because it's not going to give a cost to everyone. So if there's ways to do policy at that level, that's obviously preferable. Um, so hopefully that gives some little more technical context. That dynamic part would be the the obvious choice, I think, because it would almost certainly be delegating to a service via some sort of networking or local call that then does a networking pass through if it doesn't have like a decision cache or something like that. So like those are, yeah, like a middleware type of injector um, could be really useful. Um, I also think, like along those lines, I'm assuming this would fall in the same case as like an HTTP. There's a lot of things that inject HTTP stuff for better, or for worse. We're not going to get into that debate here, but like they'll inject in specific headers or proxy servers or whatever. And I'm assuming that kind of stuff could fit in here as well to be able to like, instead of corporate stuff having to like 
rent when you're running your applications inject something at some sort of like HTTP middleware layer, they could do it at a at like that the code level via something like this. Is that is that a correct assumption? Like if we could get that in at that dynamic layer. Yeah, so it's like the 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 actual virtual binary should be like a, as much as possible, just like root streams or things like that, and and having some configurations for that, and say, okay, take this stream ID and map it into that stream ID. And it's kind of like a mapping system, and then the the sort of orchestrator or the mutator is is sort of saying, okay, this is what you're gonna, this is the mapping you're gonna use, or this is the mapping rules you're gonna use. So it kind of passes the rules into the into the into the into the virtualizer and 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 can determine how you want to do those things. But yeah, th there's there's a lot of really interesting space to explore when you when you look at those different APIs. Um, and and just to repeat again, I think like it, it's it's about like focusing on the use cases that are are most useful. I think it, it sounds like you folks have so many interesting use cases to explore here. But like, which ones are going to be the really really valuable ones? Uh, for your users, and uh, you know, if, if if there's something I'm I'm uh, really really like looking to kind of plug this into the right use cases for for, for people to work on there, and so like um, I'm I'm always available to uh, to to walk through the code base with anyone who's interested in it, uh, has a new a new use case that they want to explore with the project, or are are looking how they can fit their use case into the project. I'm always available for a one-one -on -one discussion if, if you're uh, interested in, in how to make that work uh, on the component model. Whatever your use case, if you've got something that's going to provide you value and you, and you like the position we're in with Wazibur right now, is um, you know the, the fundamentals are in place where we've got this very strong, you know, very powerful abstraction, um, uh, and it's like it's now driven by the use cases, and and so um, uh, I want to do whatever I can. To, to assist and 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 provide the support um, around letting people drive use cases with it at this point. Awesome. Well, we're getting close to time, so I just wanted to have one last thing from you, Guy. How can people? So we have all these use cases we've mentioned. What is the best way to to uh, for people to go get involved? I mean, they, I know they can try out the stuff at the GitHub repo, but is the thing to fork it at it and say like, does this look okay, or is it some, or is there somewhere else, or some other way you want to have people like start to give that feedback? Yeah, as as I say, uh, there's uh, like posting issues is always the the best start in open source, right? You try it out. Uh, you hit an issue with the workflow you're trying to work on, and you think uh, maybe I did something stupid. Um, you know, maybe you did. Uh, maybe maybe there is a bug. Uh, post an issue. Um, this is a project where, like, I know a lot of open source maintainers say, uh, you know, make sure that you're you've you've uh, got a, like a, a really good replication and, and a really good description of the issue, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why is it we need issues? Uh, we are short on issues, so try it out. <laughs> see see where you get. Post an issue. Share some ideas. I, I want to um, ideally, uh, I think, like if you've got a really, really interesting use case and you want to bring it to the project, um, you know, there, there's a real opportunity to have an influence on the future of the project and how it fits into the component model at this early stage. Um, so for the right folks, it, it, I think there's a really great opportunity there at the moment. Uh, and, and as I say, stupid issue like uh just basic questions is is always welcome and and I, i'm i want to support people to use the project and so uh open source moves forward when you are um when, when you have that dialogue uh, so yeah uh please like do get involved in the project and and feel feel free to um ask any questions or as i say i'm always uh, available to if there's someone who wants to plug in a use case and wants to bounce it off, I'm always available for discussion on that. So. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Guy. Uh, we're at time, so we'll call it right here. Uh, I think that's a great point to call that anyway. I think we all hopefully learned a lot here. Um, we were not good at taking notes today, probably because all of us were involved in the discussion. So, no, that's not just you, David. That was me, too. I was like... I, I kind of gave up because we were all having a pretty good discussion here. So if you're sharing this with people, those of you who are here right now, tell them to go watch the recording. Because honestly, I think you're going to get more out of that than even if we were summarizing these in notes. It's probably better to come through and listen to this and see all the stuff you learned. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Um, this is going to be the last call until, wait for it, 
um, the 2nd of April because the 19th is uh, KubeCon. And so a lot of us are going to either be there or be involved or getting ready. So we will not be having a call um, two weeks from now, but we'll have another call two weeks after that. Um, if there's anything in the meantime, please bring it up inside of the, the Slack channel for the Wasm Working Group. And we hope to all see you in a, basically about a month. So thanks, everybody. And we'll see you all later. Thanks, everyone. Later.